Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the National Humanities Center webinar series. Tonight's title of the session is Pursuing Moby Dick. And uh, we're very pleased to have each of you join us. I apologize for being about a minute late. I was actually uh, watching the attendees list as it was populating and the chat box, subsequent chat box at the bottom that is, is sharing where each of you are from as you type in. And I'm always just slightly amazed at, uh, at, at having teachers from literally all over the country who can join these conversations. And we really do appreciate your willingness to work after work uh, and to, to put in your earbuds and close your door and spend some time um, with a, a scholar talking about the humanities and talk about uh, quality scholarship. I'm really pleased tonight uh, uh, to welcome you. My name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the National Humanities Center. And I'm joined by Tim Marr, who is a former National Humanities Center fellow. He was with us 2013-14. He's currently a professor of American Studies at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So both he and I are in Chapel Hill, North Carolina right now, probably just a, a few miles apart. Um, and uh, it's always a, a pleasure to be able to work with former fellows and welcome them back to this uh, to this ongoing and, and, um, and sort of uh, burgeoning conversation that we have around the humanities. Uh, Tim, I, I offer to you actually that there's no there is no alumni. You're always a, a part of our of our organization and part of our group. Um, a big part of tonight's conversation uh, will come from you in the chat box. And so I do appreciate uh, that each of you um, are saying hello and greeting. Let us know where you're from. If you're looking at the chat box now, you might see Laura, who's commenting that uh, she doesn't hear me. Um, in this first five or six minutes, as I do my, my typical framing and introduction, this is the time to make sure that your audio is working. So whether that's turning up the volume or making sure that your uh, speakers are coming through the the right input output from the go to uh, to training platform, or uh, maybe just simply um, being in a, in the right Wi-Fi spot in your in your home or school. Um, this is if you if you reach some kind of audio problem, it's almost always something that that you're going to have to to brainstorm and troubleshoot on your end. And I think it's often uh, that the, the connection just isn't strong. If you can't hear me though, then you can at least chat to me as Laura did. So down. At the very bottom of the go to training control panel, you'll see, as Thomas just did, introductions and ways that you can register thoughts, uh, ways that you can offer um, responses to different things that Tim or I might share, resources that you use in your own teaching or reflections that you have on uh, the topic that we're discussing tonight. I would encourage you to use that often and frequently. Um, uh, it's it's not a place to really sort of let go uh, unattended to. And the more you converse with us, the better. My job as moderator then is to bring in those questions and make sure that uh, Tim gives you any clarifying comments to, to to better understand the topic that he's presenting tonight. National Humanities Center is currently in our 41st year of supporting humanity scholarship through an annual fellowship program in which scholars like Tim Marr come to the center and do their research, do their writing, do their work, and most importantly, join the professional community across disciplines and across universities. In some ways, I think that mirrors the space that we try to build into our webinars, uh, being able to meet with and talk with and uh, understand different topics with folks from all kinds of backgrounds is really uh, at, the, at the heart of what the center means as a place, and I think what our webinars intend to do uh, for our education programs. Our goal really is to create bridges between that scholarly world and the world of the classroom. And so we do that in a variety of ways, including free and open resources. Uh, you can go online and go to our website now and find a deep repository of lessons, of collections of primary sources, and of scholar written essays for teachers. Just recently, I did a, uh, some analytics on our site to see what was most popular right now as I report to our board quarterly. And I realized that the teacher serve site right now is getting the most traffic. So that's a place where you can go and get, you know, uh, essays that really um, provide a, a, a scholarly understanding of some topic in your curriculum. I will admit that these resources currently are pretty heavy on history and literature, uh, but we are working hard to infuse this collection with other disciplines and other topics. Uh, I think you'll see a big change in it in the coming several months. Um, and in fact, we're moving to a completely new content management system that will allow you to really get in there and uh, work with it and break it apart and remix it and perhaps even share some of the resources that you have with us through this, uh, through this platform. Um, the webinar series is a weekly and sometimes bi-weekly event in which we ask scholars and experts in the field to share their understanding 
of a topic so that you teachers, educators can make sense of it. Um, we don't often talk about how to teach 8th or 11th or even college level classrooms, but we do talk about uh, the deep content knowledge that it takes to be a confident uh, educator and to be able to navigate student-led and inquiry-based activities in your classroom. I'm really pleased that our webinar series generally reaches capacity at 200. Um, in fact, if you look at our spring sessions, uh, almost all of them are sold out at this point. Uh, but we do have some sessions, particularly in May, that are open, and I would encourage you to go and sign up if you have interest. I'm also just about finished with the 2019-20 with next year's uh, series. We'll be announcing those sessions a little later this spring, as well as the date in which you can come and, um, and sign up for next year. All of our sessions are recorded, and so you can also go to our website and you can view recorded webinars. I don't know that they have quite the same um, uh, intrigue as maybe doing these live, but at least you can go through, you can um, pause the, the video, you can linger a little bit on the sources, you can clarify something that maybe you heard or maybe you had to step away from. Uh, so uh, definitely use that um, as best you can. We have other digital assets that you can also uh, access that includes podcast series in which we ask scholars and teachers to uh, make visible the process of working in different humanities fields. We also have a series of online courses. Uh, our spring sessions are full right now, but we will be uh, opening a full slate of online courses in the summer in August. We should have as many as 10 different titles in a variety of disciplines. Uh, these are generally five to six module or five to six week courses, and they come with a, the appropriate continuing ed credit and give you a chance to really spend time, not just in a webinar as this one, learning for 75 or, or 90 minutes, but really spending time with the scholar to, uh, to better understand some of the topics that, uh, that help you in your classroom. All of the work that I've described is informed by a very active and very talented uh, teacher advisory council. I'm really pleased at the work these 15 educators have done on our behalf. Um, they're often in the rooms with us, so if you see any of these names in the chat box, say hey, including Katie Willett. Um, and I, I do want to invite uh, each of you, if you're interested in contributing to and being a part of our National Humanities Center work, to uh, keep an eye out for the application process, likely in April. And the next term would start in, uh, in August of 2019. If you go to our website uh, webinar page, you can download this PDF that allows you to pre-approve uh, these webinars for continuing ed credit with your district or with your school. Um, you can download this, fill it out, and then as you complete each webinar, just attach those certificates to this uh, single form and turn it in to your administration. Um, if you ever run across um, expectations that you have in terms of professional development that you feel these webinars might hit, but we have not articulated for some reason, maybe there's a language or a, you know, a, a goal that your district or school has that we're not aware of, uh, I'm more than happy to provide um, either a letter or an email or somehow modify this document so that it, it serves, your, serves your, uh, your needs. When tonight's session is completed uh, and I close the room, you'll be prompted with a survey to then receive that certificate. So uh, take a minute, fill that out, let us know how the webinar went, and then you'll receive a certificate you can download and print that has your name on it and certifies the hours that you spent with us. I appreciate you letting me uh, introduce the center and share with you a little bit more about the work that we do. Uh, a lot of our work is virtual, a lot of our work is on site and face to face, and I would encourage you to reach out to me or my colleague Libby Taylor or Mike Williams and let us know about opportunities or gaps that you feel we might be able to address. Uh, let us know uh, ways in which we might work specifically with your district. Um, and let us know if there's anything in, in these kinds of events and these kinds of activities that we can, we can offer that will help you in the, the good work that you do. So we're here tonight though to talk with Tim Marr, who again is at UNC Chapel Hill, just down the road from, uh, from me right now. Uh, Tim's in the American Studies Department and again, a former fellow. Uh, he also leads an NEH-sponsored uh, summer institute for teachers, 10-day institute, on this very same topic, Moby Dick. And so uh, without being uh, without being too funny about it, I think this is a big topic, and I'm going to jump right in. So, hey, Tim, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you all hear me? Tim, you're a little bit, uh, a little bit fuzzy right now. I wonder if uh, your microphone might be uh, scraping your shirt collar or if you can move maybe a little closer. Mm, still just a little bit uh, not very clear. Um, okay. You, how about, you almost got it. Say something for me. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm back on here. That's uh, it. That's okay? 
That's perfect. So Tim, thank you again for joining us. And Tim, I'm going to invite you to introduce yourself, but I do want to uh, give a little bit of a punchline here. And that is you've got the credibility that most scholars, as wonderful as they might be, as smart and well-published and elite as they might be, just don't have. And that is you taught high school. Yes, I'm so glad to have you all come in from around the world. It's, it's very Melvillian to be able to check in from all quarters across space. Uh, yes, uh, um, but I, I think I'm probably like most of you that when I was assigned Moby Dick in college, I didn't read the whole thing. And it really wasn't until I was teaching high school that I got my head in and started to get it around and through the book. And it was a strange time. I was teaching at Lahore American School in Pakistan during the Russian phase of the Afghani war. And I, uh, I showed up at the school. It was before you could order books from around the world and went down to the basement. And they had sets of Moby Dick that I taught to these Pakistani high schoolers. Uh, and uh, and uh, that, that was the, uh, the impetus that sent me back to graduate school. I did an NEH seminar on Moby Dick in the summer. Um, and Andy had mentioned that um, uh, I was the director of one of those in New Bedford last summer for two weeks. And today was the due date for, a, uh, uh, for the reapplication. And I urge you, if we're fortunate enough uh, to be able to offer the Institute again, that in June of 2020, you can apply to come to New Bedford and spend two weeks jumping into this text uh, instead of uh, the, uh, the dive that we have tonight for 75 minutes. So, um, uh, so uh, I see that you're, you're all from, from all around the world. I'm, I'm wondering if you might, each of you, um, uh, put in, uh, uh, write in whether you have, uh, whether you have, uh, if you have taught the book, to what course and grade have you taught Moby Dick? That's a great uh, entry point there, Tim. And I'm, I'm while folks are typing in uh, a response to your question, I'm going to maybe tweak your microphone just a little bit more. I, uh, Tim, are you using an earbud or uh, are you talking right into your computer? I'm not. I'm talking right into my computer. OK. Yeah, I think the closer you are, the, the better it sounds. But let's see what folks have to say. It looks like uh, Jen uh, ends back up in New Jersey, has not taught it. Um, we've got uh, World History, 10th and 11th. Who's taught Moby Dick? Marielle says she loves it, but and wants to teach it, but has not yet. Ginger hasn't quite taught. I wonder if this is one of those books, Tim, that it's the best known book in the world that nobody uh, has finished. <laughs> um, uh, that, it, it, Moby Dick is known as uh, for its iconic power more than people actually being able to uh, to uh, engage and explore it. Uh, and I think that's what's powerful about it is everybody knows about Moby Dick. They know about Ahab's search for the right whale. They know about uh, uh, they uh, they know about um, uh, uh, Moby Dick and uh, the icon of the right whale and it being uncatchable. Uh, but that comes to them through cultural literacy and not through an actual engagement with Melville's own language. And um, I'd like to move into that language now, but Andy, I'm wondering um, uh, about uh, moving down these slides here. I still have the first slide. That's right. So Tim, I've given you control of the mouse on my machine. So down in the lower left corner of your screen, you should see uh, an arrow button that you can advance. And if not, I'm happy to do it for you. Okay, let's find it. Do you see it there? Yes. I'll tell you what, Tim, just, to make this smoother for you then, why don't you let me advance it and I'll just sort of, I'll be intuitive about when that is, but if there's something you want me to move on to, just say, next hey, slide. Sorry about that. Let's go down to um, the picture um, of Melville. How's that one? Can you I see that? See, I'm not seeing it, um, uh, but um, let me, uh, I can go to my own, my own uh, PowerPoint here. Um, Do you see that, Tim? Um, uh, I don't. I don't see. I don't see it on. Uh, I see. I'm still having the uh, the actual um, 
the actual web page with the uh, prime first slide that we have on here. Um, All right. Hold on just one second and let me uh, let me play around with it. Thank you. I apologize for the disruption. I apologize too. Yeah. Do you see that? Um, there we go. I see it now. Thank you so much. So um, I, I want to start by, here's the question. The reason why I'm fascinated by Melville is because he's someone who lived in the 19th century, long dead. It's the, uh, it's the 100th, 100th anniversary of his birth this year. There's going to be a big conference in New York in June. So he's long gone, but Melville lived so intensely through his words that he can actually, you can actually feel intimate with someone who lived in another century. And that's because he threw his thinking and his life into his art. So what I'd like you to do is look at the, uh, one of those colored pictures and look into the eyes. The one on the left is more of the age of Melville when he wrote Moby Dick, but the famous Eaton print from 1870s is the one on the right. And those eyes are, are special. And this is what Sophia Hawthorne, Nathaniel's wife, um, how he described Herman. He's tall and erect with an air of free, brave, and manly. Look in his eyes. When conversing, he is full of gesture and force and loses himself in his subject. There is no grace nor polish. Once in a while, his animation gives place to a singularly quiet expression out of those eyes to which I have objected. An indrawn, dim look which at the same time makes you feel that he is at that instant taking deepest note of what is before him. It is a strange, lazy glance but with a power in it quite unique. It does not seem to penetrate through you to take you into himself. And I think that that power, we don't get to witness Melville, we can see in his eyes here, but we know him through his words. And if you go on to the next uh, slide, Andy, I'm still... Uh, 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 I think that one of the things that in teaching Moby Dick that's crucial is to relish the beauty of his language. And uh, here, uh, here you hear his language. Uh, one often hears of writers that rise and swell with their subject, though it might seem but an ordinary one. How then with me, writing of this Leviathan, unconsciously my chirography expands into placard capitals. Give me a condor's quill. Give me Vesuvius's crater for an inkstand. Friends, hold my arms. For in the mere act of penning my thoughts of this Leviathan, they weary me and make me faint with their outreaching comprehension of sweep. As if to include the whole circle of the sciences and all the generations of whales and men and mastodons, past, present, and to come with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth and throughout the whole universe, not excluding the suburbs. Such and so magnifying is the virtue of a large and liberal theme. We expand to its bulk. To produce a mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. No great and enduring volume can ever be written on the flea, or many there be that have tried it. He's, he's talking about here the revolving panoramas, which was the, uh, the technology of entertainment. They just showed an amazing panorama of a world visit, uh, a, a whale visit around the world uh, that was uh, uh, unfolded for, for uh, hundreds of yards. And Melville's bringing in the sweep of this. But relishing Melville's language is crucial. And I think if we go to the next slide, we can see uh, that. Uh, one of the problems with Moby Dick uh, is, um, is uh, what is the text? Uh, there were two texts published in 1851. Um, Americans had to get their books published in England in order to have international copyright. So the proofs were made in the American edition and sent over to Britain. The British edition was called The Whale. You can see it on the bottom. It's a triple decker. And um, <clears throat> And uh, uh, the American edition is on top, published a month later. Uh, and the challenge is these are two different editions. <clears throat> Can you write down um, uh, uh, which, um, uh, wh if you teach Moby Dick or read it, which edition um, you, uh, uh, you, you use or write? Uh, uh, which uh, edition of Moby Dick you use? Often there's the, <clears throat> 
There's the Norton edition, and there's other editions. Lots of different language, lots of lots of different purposes. Is it, uh, I'm not seeing uh, what people are saying, Andy. Well, so far, yeah, I think folks are just listening to you and they're they're taking this in. Um, and so, right now we're on the fluid text uh, slide, correct? Yes, the fluid text. So what happened is that editors tried to put these two volumes together. And it's challenging because it's hard to realize why there are differences between them. And uh, one of the editions called the Longman edition actually starts with the American version and then highlights the differences between that and the British edition. And it's really rather powerful uh, 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 to see uh, the changes that were made. And that, that web address at the bottom will go and allow you to compare the proofs of the two. If we go to the next, we can see some of the changes that take place. This is the Longman edition, and there are 200 revision signs. What the British edition did is it, is it censored the American edition, and it, uh, it took out a lot of uh, racy language that was sexual or blasphemous or religious or political and made those changes. Examples of here is, uh, uh, is do you suppose now Ishmael, that the magnanimous God of heaven and earth, pagans and all included, can possibly be jealous of an in insignificant piece of black wood? Impossible. This is when Ishmael uh, bows down to uh, Queequeg's god Yojo on this verse about uh, flask being aware of for fornication in the islands. If we go to the next one, we can see a couple other changes that, uh, uh, that have taken place. You can read these. The last one is powerful because it's in Queequeg's language. He says, me savvy plenty. Uh, Queequeg no care what God made him shark, whether Fiji God or Nantucket God, but the God what made shark must be one damn engine. And this brings up a kind of novel's play with stereotype and, and racism, but in this case, he's turning uh, the deity itself into an ethnic other. Like what happens uh, when Fleece the Cook uh, uh, says that the uh, uh, God Massa Shank. Uh, 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 this obviously is blasphemous, and the British didn't like it, and they took it out. Uh, if we go to the next version, the next page, we can see that not only were there uh, sections left out, but there were key chapters. A whole chapter was left out. The American edition has one less. Chapter 25, postscript, is not there in the British edition. And it was this short chapter that talked about how the kings and queens of England anointed their, uh, their hair with sperm oil uh, as if it was the head of a salad. And they're talking about the whalemen actually dispersing their sperm into the wigs of the monarchy. And this was just way too much for the British. And they just cut the whole chapter out. Uh, more yeah. disturbing and challenging was the fact that the epilogue that indicated that uh, Moby Dick was a lot, uh, that uh, Ishmael survived to tell the tale, was left out of the triple decker of the third version uh, issue of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, London uh, first edition of Moby Dick, and etymology and extracts were placed at the end. So uh, these changes may make up different editions, and, uh, and the Longman edition says that it's important to look at the fluidity between these and understand uh, about the publication history uh, because of these changes, and not like the Norton edition, which is an eclectic edition that tries to determine what the guess by reason what the final intentions of Melville would be. So that's a little bit about the history um, of the book itself. Tim, uh, Tim let me um, ask you just a quick question before we move on. Tim, can you, uh, can you talk a little bit about any kind of criticism or political overlay to the kinds of uh, censoring or editing or difference between these two editions? Um, how, how did the general public, how did the literary world respond to that? Well, I think what's amazing is that Melville did not get the readers in his time that we have now, and they did not look carefully at, uh, at uh, how subversive and, uh, uh, and challenging his writing was. The British uh, publisher did, and that's why he left these out. He found novel to be sexually racy. Uh, he found, um, and he found also uh, um, the references to religion 
um, Melville said, I, I've, I've written a wicked book uh, and feel spotless as the lamb. Uh, he knew uh, this book, uh, he says, Ahab, that it's, uh, that it's uh, written in the name of the devil, baptized in the name of the devil. That doesn't mean that Melville thought it was a blasphemous book, but he was writing truth through his own book of Ishmael uh, by telling a different way of telling the truth through fiction. And I think this, um, of course, was challenging to those with conventional notions of religion. And that explains some of the changes in the British edition. Thank you. So um, if we go to the next, this here shows that Melville was an incredibly um, obsessive writer. But he had gone to the Pacific in 1841 for about two and a half years and came back. And uh, in looking for a career, he began to tell stories about, about his trip uh, to the Pacific. And going to the Pacific was going around a horn south in south of South America, uh, the longest journey that humans could make on the earth, journeys that people don't make anymore that long. Uh, the equivalent today is to go, to go into space. Uh, Melville went to this other world and came back and had stories to tell. And, and his story about leaving ship into the Marquesas Island was his first and ultimately most popular novel. And the sequel, had Taipei, the character in that, going to Tahiti. His third book, Manny, which was not successful at all, uh, the, the uh, narrator gets launched into the middle of the Pacific and travels around to all these Pacific islands. Polynesia means many islands. And each of those islands becomes symbolic of one of the countries in the world. And it really is a tour of the whole world. But it's so allegorical uh, and it doesn't have the ballast of fact that Moby Dick has that it didn't get readers. And uh, in order to then try to make some money as a writer, because it was his primary profession, Melville wrote Redburn and White Jacket, Redburn about his earliest trip as a 19-year-old to Liverpool and back in the Merchant Marine, and White Jacket about his return from the Pacific when he signed up for a naval ship and came back around uh, Cape Horn uh, and uh, returned from that, that, uh, that journey to the Pacific. He wrote both of these books in one summer. And they're, they're not quite as long as Moby Dick, but it's an incredible feat. And he said he did it like sawing wood to raise, uh, to make money for his family. Um, and uh, he went in 1849 to London to try to sell White Jacket so it could be published there in England, like we had said with Moby Dick. And that trip to England as a published author had enormous influences on his aspiration as a writer. It reintroduced, reintroduced him to Shakespeare and uh, and the uh, British literary heritage experientially. And he came back and uh, began Moby Dick and took an extra year to do that because it was this book that brought together the exploration, his own experience, uh, and, uh, and that's why in some ways has the grandeur and majesty that it does. I think what's powerful is that the other ones are based, other than allegorical Marty, are based on segments of Melville's own travels. Moby Dick is based on his whole experience as a traveler, but where does where does uh, uh, the uh, uh, Pequod go? It doesn't go around South America. It goes around Africa and through the Indian Ocean. So Melville actually sets out into the ocean in a direction he had never gone in, and that says something about Moby Dick. And just quickly. Uh, you might think that he might be exhausted by writing this novel, but he turned around and again and wrote another novel in the next year that was even longer than Moby Dick. His first novel, Set on Land, which is a psychological novel about uh, growing up in the Hudson Valley, um, which, is, uh, uh, which was uh, so damning to readers that he really was never able to publish a major novel again and turn to short fiction. I'm sharing this because I... I want to show how Melville is, he's committed as a writer. And then even though he doesn't have a publisher who can publish his books, he does publish shorter fiction and he publishes his poems. Uh, most of his life he writes as a poet, poet and publishes them with his own money at the end of his life. But he continues to write throughout his life and find new ways to express himself uh, in the circumstances that he's in. And I think uh, that's why Melville can speak to us directly because he lived through his words as a writer. 
um, uh, uh, and uh, we feel that with the energy of Moby Dick, which is in many ways poetry and prose. So I, um, let's understand that uh, it's Melville's uh, sixth book in six years, uh, and uh, uh, and it is quite quite a feat, and a lot comes together. It has the uh, philosophy of Mardu, but it has the ballast and the uh, material culture. You actually feel like you're aboard the ship, and the combination is what brings it its grandeur. We can go on to the next one. Um, please ask any questions that you might have. Um, as, as we work th through this, and Andy's, Andy can see the questions, um, I'm not seeing them very well, and pass them on to me. Yeah, I can, Tim. And, you know, I, it strikes me, too, that um, that Moby Dick, in, in all ways, is an overwhelming, iconic text, right? And so there's, there's likely, I think, finding those entry points is going to be a, a really interesting part of tonight. Um, based on what you've shared so far, when you teach this or you share it with teachers in your summer institute, what seems to be the most common entry point? Where, where do teachers tend to, to find purchase in the, the, the way that you're describing this? Well, I'm imagining that um, uh, one of the ways in is through the characters. And uh, I want to point out some, um, um, a few other ways into the text before getting to the characters, because, uh, um, um, and I, I actually, I'll point out some ways of getting into it now. I mean, one of the ways is looking at how it has spawned visual culture. And from this 1930 book of Rockwell Kent, uh, you can see Ahab in there on the lower left. It becomes an iconic image. Uh, uh, and uh, Melville grew up from um, The Sea Beast was a film in the 1920s, one of the earliest films that had a silent and a, a talky version and uh, uh, with uh, John Barrymore. And uh, Moby Dick grew up with American popular culture and was rediscovered in the 20s uh, as a text that uh, expressed the power of America when the United States was trying to uh, establish its cultural nationalism after the power it had gained after World War I. It had to invent its own cultural heritage. And at that point, Moby Dick spoke to the, uh, to the lost generation uh, and it had an audience it never had in its time. Um, I think the challenge with readers today is how to connect it to their own experience. And there's different ways of doing that, but really Neville teaches readers how to read if you go along with his lines and let him pull you into his text. He teaches the reader how to read it. And uh, so the real thing is to engage with the text and let Neville teach you its meanings by how it unfolds through the experiential act of engaging it. And uh, so one of the ways of getting it, um, well, if we go to the next one, I can say that, you know, Melville is, this is fiction. He's telling, uh, it's based upon his experience, but he's making this up. He's spinning the yarn, which is uh, what sailors talked about when they're telling tall tales. And uh, this, this loomings that you saw uh, in that wave in the prior uh, slide, um, this looming of time, this weaving of the narrative, this is Melville's creative process. And he even sees it in, in that chapter 102 there, the third quote, as the way that God weaves. Uh, 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 and he uses the industrial society of these looms, these industrial looms, and hearing these, uh, the ply of the warp and woof. At the end, he says, the mingled thread, mingling threads of life are worn by warp and roof, woven by warp and roof, calms and storms woven together. Not as bringing together his tapestry through a lie of his fiction, but in so doing, he calls it the great art of telling, of telling the truth. And remember when Pip goes down in the castaway and gets abandoned in the middle of the ocean and basically has an experience of drowning and going to the bottom of the ocean, and there at the bottom of the ocean, he sees God's foot on the treadle of the loom. And he speaks that creative power, not the Michelangelo vision of touching the hand of men from above, but this coral insect sort of growing, a geological growing from the ground up. And uh, Pip loses his mind. And Melville says that man's insanity is heaven's sense. So I want you to think, and one of the ways of relating is to look at Melville spinning this yarn, uh, telling tall tales. So that's one of the ways into it. And uh, I think the main way into it is the next one, is that I think it's key. The next slide shows us that the key difference is that there are two Moby Dicks. One is Melville's text, 
which has a hyphen in it. And you can always teach your students to make this important distinction that Moby Dick without a hyphen is a reference to the white whale. But the fact that they get confused and that that hyphen makes a difference is because Melville's own text is models itself on the whale. That it, uh, that it, it is massive. It is iconic. Okay, and in this chapter here on the tail, uh, it's not just the T-A-I-L of Moby Dick, but Mel was talking about his own tale here. Uh, Moby Dick, the book's amazing strength, uh, um, where the graceful flexion of its motions, where infantileness of ease undulates through a titanism of power. Uh, this is the magic, the beauty of his text. But Mel was borrowing from the majesty of Moby Dick the whale in making his own Moby Dick the text. And another chapter on the line, there are rail lines in Moby Dick, but the real rail lines are the fact that you're caught in Melville's own lines uh, and uh, you're harpooned by his text and linked to it by the monkey rope of Melville's pumping intricacies. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, I think he talks one point that if you're sitting there with a poker in the fire at home reading this, you're in as much peril as a harpooner. And uh, Melville is, uh, he's using his pen as a harpoon, and these lines that he is writing are, are weaving into you and pulling you into his text. Another way that the whale and the book are together. Moby Dick is known as ubiquitous and immortal, or again, in ensanguined billows, hundreds of leagues away, his unsullied jet would once more be seen. He's seen as coming up in different parts of the world at the same time. Well, hasn't that happened? with the reputation of this text in the way that rumor, wild rumors about it uh, have, uh, have continued to expand and people know and tell tales about Moby Dick the book that the sailors told about the white whale that Melville was writing about. So I think that making this link is a really crucial way of, of making the book live and seeing that the mammal and the text um, have a lot of similarities. Tim, that's a, a, a lot that you've shared there. And, you know, it seems like particularly this distinction of the hyphen versus not is something that, you know, it's a pretty quick visual check that teachers can share with their students. Um, when you do this yourself, uh, how do students typically react to that distinction? Is it is it something they can really grapple with pretty quickly and easily? I think they can because um, they come in having to wade through and dive through the reputation of this huge text that everybody says they've never read or I wish they could read it, I wish I could read it. Um, and, uh, uh, and so they are actually dealing with the rumor of Moby Dick, the text, which is very much like the whale. They can definitely uh, connect to that. Uh, so, uh, so I think making that link is important. And the next slide shows another possible link that's really crucial. And that is the difference between the Ishmael who goes on the Pequod at the beginning of this text and the Ishmael that writes the book after he survives the drowning of everybody else he's writing about. And uh, this is, these are different sensibilities. And remember, Ishmael is not a real person. He's called that uh, in, the, uh, in the recent opera, Peggy's opera, Call me Ishmael is the last word, are the last words of the opera that Ishmael, he's born as Ishmael when he comes up and survives the tale he's telling. Uh, but, uh, you know, it took a long time for Ishmael to be able to narrate the horrors and trauma that he went through in surviving uh, Ahab's feud. And uh, I think it's really important to see these moments in the text where the Ishmael, the survivor, is living in other parts of the world and exploring knowledge and seeking out new meanings of the whale, meanings of the whale that are different from Ahab's in order to survive Ahab's uh, pull on him and to get beyond the trauma. And he's only able to do that when he's fully able to tell the tale. So you can see here that uh, that he's, he goes back to the uh, to Polynesia where, near where Kukweg's home must be and tattoos the measurements of the whale on his body, Ishmael becomes tattooed in some ways like Queequeg. Uh, and he says here, uh, 
I am a savage. I myself am a savage right at the bottom here, owing, owning no allegiance but to the king of cannibals and ready at any moment to rebel against him. This Ishmael is the character in the Bible who is cast out of the covenant of Israel, of Israel and goes with, uh, um, into the desert with Hagar and uh, actually is the progenitor of the Arab race, uh, this man whose hand is against all men. And these wild wanderings is important because this is how Ishmael gets his worldview that allows him to be the complex narrator who can tell this tale is very different than the ignorant greenhorn who begins uh, in the land chapters at the outset. So Tim, I, I wanna bring a question in from our audience. And while I do this, uh, Ryan, I'm gonna ask you to expand on your comment just a little bit. Um, but first, let me start with Kyle Jones's uh, comment. Um, five or six minutes ago, Kyle found it really interesting the way that you were describing his travels and the subsequent use of those themes of geography, how they might be impact. Um, the fact that he traveled so much prior to writing Moby Dix feels like something that, that, that we could reveal to and make accessible to, to younger students. Um, Kyle's offered a couple of possible prompts there, but, but tell us a little bit, talk a little bit about that that theme of geography and how you feel like uh, Melville's uh, own personal travels might have, have been an important part of how to understand this. Well, well the, book, uh, the book begins with uh, extracts and etymology with these characters, the sub-sub librarian and the pale usher who have gathered all these words and quotations about the whale. And I think that whole gesture shows that this, the post Pequot Ishmael is is attempting to understand the whale in as many ways as possible, at ways that are very different than the malignant, uh, intelligent whale that uh, that Ahab sees in uh, in Moby Dick. Um, so I think it does reflect Melville's sort of attempt to uh, uh, embrace uh, everything that he can read about the whale. Uh, but it takes him a while to be able to tell that story. The next uh, slide talks about. Um, talks about one of those moments, and it's a really powerful moment. It's the first part of Moby Dick. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is called the Town Ho Story. Uh, and it was published separately uh, as a separate short story before Moby Dick was published. And it's interesting when you teach this, this you can teach this before the semester before to give a taste of how Moby Dick, uh, getting ready for Moby Dick later, because in some ways it opens up the themes. But it's powerful here because here Ishmael is in Lima, Peru, talking with these Catholic dons. Uh, uh, and the, he's telling the story of Town Ho's story. And in the middle of it, he mentions Moby Dick, a very white and famous and mostly dead, deadly immortal monster. And he says, that would be too long a story. And then these Spaniards are crowding around him and he starts to faint. I cannot rehearse that now. Let me get more of the air, sirs. And they have to give, give him some more alcohol to, to raise him. So at this moment, he can't even conceive or think about more ridiculous. It's still traumatic. And the post Pequot Ishmael has to work through that. Uh, and in, in many ways, the ability to retell that story and survive again is his liberation from the thraldom of Ahab, his final liberation. But he has to earn it by developing the experience to be able to narrate it and overcome it. And I think that's the, uh, I think that's the important um, thing to say. So we've talked about two things. We've talked about how the book and the whale are equivalent and can be studied as models for each other. And we've talked about the importance of understanding that there are two Ishmaels, the naive greenhorn at the beginning who doesn't know how to deal with Queequeg and this incredibly wise and cosmopolitan narrator who pulls together the whole world in narrating his texts and is finally able to free himself and survive once more. But I think there's another way of getting into this text. Let me see. Um, uh, if there's a, if there's another question here um there, there is tim so thomas is asking what do you think the author's point is with regard to the whale tattoo well i mean ishmael is uh, is tattooed uh, uh the post pequot ishmael and remember queequeg is too and uh they share a skin the counterpane the blanket at the beginning is not just a blanket they become one skin and uh queequeg gives up his life for that little duty ashore and his uh his coffin turns into the life buoy that saves 
Ishmael at the end of the text. And that life buoy has the tattoos that are on Queequeg's skin etched into the life buoy itself. So in some ways, Queequeg uh, and, and Ishmael survive together. And I think all these wanderings of Ishmael and the tattooing is in some ways his continuing connection to Queequeg um, as someone who, who guides him uh, 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 through to the experience of being able to write the text. Fantastic. And one last question I'd like you to respond to, Tim, is something that Ryan started, and there's been a couple of comments in a thread uh, from uh, Jennifer and others. Um, how do you feel, how do you approach this, uh, having these conversations about race and representation in these kinds of passages? I think the, uh, the thread that I showed you on Melville Skylarking is that he uses stereotype to expose uh, the the uh, vapidness and ignorance of stereotype. And uh, I think it's a challenge because uh, in today's day and age, um, a word can be, any word can be taken as, as a racial challenge. And Melville is using those words more deviously in order to expose the ignorance behind it. And it, it takes a little while to, uh, to understand uh, that uh, Melville's apparent racism is actually his means of undoing the conventions that are racist in his own culture. That is a challenge to do. It's very important to do. Great, thank you. If we go to the next one, we can see another way into this text is saying that Moby Dick is not a novel itself. Do you have students who, no matter what book they're writing about, they call it a novel? Where did that come from? I don't understand that. But Moby Dick, I don't think, is a novel. It's a, you, there are two things I think you can call it. You can call it a mixed form genre, and um, what Harrison Hayford, the Melville scholar, called defiant anomaly, uh, uh, anomalies of genre. Okay, on one level, it has this metaphysical philosophy and poetry and romantic allegory, and sometimes in the same chapter that comes out of the beginning where it starts, starts with factual description and science this uh, rooted material cetological center that uh, uh, Howard P. Vincent. And it is this sort of mix between these realms that makes uh, Moby Dick so full. Uh, and uh, if one of the ways into Moby Dick is to look at these different genres, especially in an English classroom. If we go to the next uh, slide, we can, see, um, um, we can see that Melville is sort of cooking up this uh, special concoction at the bottom uh, the British review of Moby Dick says, we would have looked for philosophy in Wales or for poetry in Blubber. But Melville is doing that. So Richard Henry Dana, when he's writing this, he, he says Moby Dick will be a strange sort of book. It's Blubber, but you have to get oil out of it. But it's like poetry, it's like taking sap from a maple tree and turning it into a uh, syrup. You have to cook it up and throw it in. This is a cooking process. Okay, and by so doing, he's trying to give truth by uh, by the sublimation of the blubber into oil into whale. And um, I think if we go down three slides ahead here, um, uh, Andy, there's one that says a um, uh, couple more. Um, uh, uh, go one more. Yeah, um, one more ahead, and it says trying out. Um, right there. Here, um, or the last one. This okay. one. Let's go, on, let's go on back to where we were. Um, and this idea of trying out, I mean, when your students write an essay, um, uh, go on back a couple of slides, uh, please, Andy. When your students write an essay, an essay is a trying out. It's a trying, okay? And I think, uh, I think Melville is trying everything he can in this text to pull together the world. And uh, one of the ways he does that is through the different generic forms. This is why it's hard to call it a novel, because it's a sermon, it's a satire, it's a tall tale, it's a legal brief, it's biography, it's classification. These are some of the generic forms and some of the chapters where he's doing these different genres and holding them together in this mosaic of a text, looking at different ways of knowing in some ways to show that you need to express all of them to get a glimpse of what it might possibly mean to know, and that not one of these ways of expression can hold the truth. You have to kind of throw out your net and haul in what's ever there. Um, and in the next slide, there's a, a bunch of other forms. Soliloquy, you go, uh, 
Midnight Forecastle is actually a drama. When they do the marathon reading of Moby Dick for 25 hours every January in New Bedford and every August at Mystic, um, in New Bedford, they have a local troupe come out and act out that drama, because it is drama. Um, and we talked about race, uh, Stub Supper is blackface minstrelsy and uh, uh, the Mass of Shrek, and that has to be uh, pulled down, but it shows how police is actually, uh, in some ways, getting the critical upper hand uh, on the, uh, the mate uh, who's taking advantage of it. And of course, philosophical meditation uh, and, um, and these action chapters at the end that readers are so happy to get to when you come out of this meditation into the actual pursuit of the whale until it goes down at the end. So I think one of the ways into this text is, is looking at these different genres and we can divide your students up and have them look at a chapter and look at the genre and then talk about why does Marvel tell this tale through so many different means and what does it say about telling the truth and what does it reveal about the complexity of his whale with a capital W. So that's another way into the text that I think can be can be pretty useful. And um, that's called a mixed form genre. And so I think it's more that than a novel. And if you go to the next slide, um, the, uh, uh, E.L. Doctorow, the novel, um, um, Ragtime used to be taught a lot in high school. Um, uh, he talks about in the second line of Moby Dick being manipian satire. Uh, and what that means is he calls it an anatomy. And this is the way he describes Moby Dick. And doesn't it sound like it? A big kitchen sink sort of a book in which the irrepressible author, a writing fool, throws everything he knows, happily changing voice, philosophizing, violating the consistent narrative, dropping in every arcane bit of information he can think of, reworking his research, indulging in parody, unleashing his pure powers of description. So that the real Moby Dick is the voracious ma of the book swallowing the English language. I think Dr. O's got it here. The Moby Dick is the whale here that's eating up, uh, eating up language. Uh, and he sees that connection between the book and the whale. But this notion of manipulation satire, those of you that teach, uh, um, teach, might teach us in an AP class, that's a good genre to know about. So, um, um, so let's see. Um, so that's another way of getting into it through genre, but there's many ways to enter Moby Dick because there's many things that a novel is trying. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see another way into it that Ishmael himself engages in in the second part of the text. Once they capture the whales and start cutting the blubber off and then dicing the blubber and then turning it into oil, um, no, uh, there's a series of chapters that looks at parts of the whales, parts of the whale, anatomizes it, and philosophizes about those portions of the whale. It starts with cetology, which is classifying whales, where we move from the blubber to the skin to the blanket skin to the corpse of the whale that's actually confused as an island on the maps, the head of the whale in the case, the eyes. And let me talk about the eyes for a moment because I think it's a powerful way to get students to think about well, what Melville's doing. Do you remember what he said about the eyes of the whale? Or where are the eyes of a whale? Uh, what, what part of a, are they, are they in the front the way ours are? No, Let's at, take a minute. Let's take a minute and see what people say. Um, so this is a, Quick trivia question to the audience. Where are the eyes located on a whale? And Tim, this will give you a chance to get a drink of water as well. <laughs> on the side, says Karen Day. On the sides, but how do you see <laughs> if you have two eyes looking the opposite way? Kyle offers that they are <laughs> Looking in two directions at the same time, Carlos mm -hmm. says above the mouth. Mm -hmm. Two directions at the same time. So Melville, Melville meditates on the, this brain of the whale that can actually take two diametrically opposed positions and somehow synthesize it. Our eyes actually turn things that are upside down so we think that it's upside up. But we're actually looking through the inside of our eyes. We don't see the outside of our eyes. 
a whale's eye is looking two different directions. That's one of the reasons why it has to move back and forth so it can get its eye so that it can see. And there is this notion that, um, that the thinker that has to become like the whale. Um, novel here, Under the Blanket, he says, uh, the third quote here, O man, admire and model thyself after the whale. Retain, O man, in all seasons the temperature of thine own. He talks about the whale's blubber keeping it warm when it goes into the Arctic, and somehow he's able to go into the warmer waters and adapt from uh, internally to that different temperature. This anatomizing, he looks at the forehead where there are no eyes, it's just a battering ram, the face that has no visage or countenance, um, and then goes into the brain and the spinal cord, following it down to that last vertebrae that's like the uh, a billiard ball that. Uh, uh, um, that uh, Joseph Conrad says is made out of the, t uh, the tusks of the elephants. Uh, and we've talked about how the tail and, uh, is, uh, uh, is a reference to the book itself in some important ways. And amazingly, transgressive chapters in which he has, um, uh, which they actually um, um, circumcise the whale and put the foreskin on and wear it. And Noble uses the word bishopric with a K at the end of it and gets away with it, even in the British edition, because it's a, um, it's one of the spellings of bishopric. Uh, but he's making fun of the investments of the whale and putting on these uh, uh, these uh, 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 vestments, uh, making it into a foreskin. And he takes it down to the bones and the fossils, and those are the false, the bones are the, uh, uh, or what he puts tattoos onto his body. So what does this mean? It means that Ishmael, even while he's looking at the whale in the text, is looking at it in as many ways as possible, trying to distill meaning out of different portions. And by doing all of it, he's realizing that you can't actually get at it in this way. But he's doing it so comprehensively that, uh, that it teaches us uh, about different ways of knowing. And uh, this is a really helpful way into the text. Have any of you ever used uh, used uh, this way of um, of opening up uh, Melville's philosophy by relating it to these different parts of the whale? The other way of doing it is relating it to the different implements uh, of the whaling industry, which he also talks about as having philosophical uh, dimensions to it. Um, this cutting in, this uh, and. Uh, and this is the trying trying out because uh, um, I think it's uh, I think it's crucial that uh, okay so here's the question for you um, the the blubber is made into oil that's brought home and sold for a precious price in the ports what is that whale what is that whale oil used for hmm. That's an interesting question. Let's see. Uh, I think I think Kyle Jones, uh, lantern oil says Ryan. Kyle's, Kyle's coming back with lamps, light lighting fuel. Lighting fuel, yes. Yeah. So the uh, and Perfect. the perfume, right. the perfume comes from the ambergris uh, from inside, also from rotting parts of the whale is turned into perfume that is put into the uh, elegant culture of the wealthy. Um, it's this sublimation process. I think if we go to the next slide, we can see that um, this try, uh, this uh, go a couple, this is where I want to go a couple ahead there, Andy, to the trying out where it says trying out on top. Next one, yeah. So whale into blubber into oil, and you say that it's used for lamps and light. That's the very light that's being used to read this text. It, it, and it is this sublimation from this um, very gory, portion of a whale, it's sublimated into the very uh, illumination of civilization. Uh, and uh, he talks about this when he talks about the whale skin, that he uses it as a uh, as spectacles to look through. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I think this is a uh, this is a trying out of what he's doing. And he's making fun of civilization to say that what you see is being a real cultural accomplishment is actually just the uh, bringing up of this um, of this uh, kind of savage practice of killing mammals. Uh, 
So that's Ishmael when he's telling the story of, 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 uh, of Moby Dick and going through the different portions and making sense of the whole process of turning blubber into oil. But you know what? Ishmael does, doesn't he, get different views of, Ish of the whale than Ahab has. He's caught into the whale being something that shocks him with its whiteness and its atheism, all color, this presence, absent presence of color, haunts him because it's like the whiteness of the skull, the sepulcher. Um, and, but that's when he's under Ahab's thraldom. As he grows and moves around and reads more, he gets different notions of the whale. Um, if we can go back a couple slides now to that, we can see that, um, that, look at some of these quotes here, take a moment to read them because these are not Ahab's whale. This is Ishmael seeing that the whale is actually, is actually something of beauty. Uh, and this is not the anatomizing of portions of the whale uh, and taking the part and trying to understand the whole. These are moments when the whaler goes out and sees the living whale in the midst of the ocean. And uh, especially in the bottom quote about breaching, when, when the whale comes completely out of the water, uh, uh, out of its own element, and is seen as living, uh, not just the, uh, uh, the measurement of his skeleton. But Ishmael comes to see the whale as something of beauty. And, uh, and, and uh, I think that that is the uh, part of the dynamic aspect of this novel is that it counters Ahab's reading of Moby Dick. I think Ahab uh, turns Moby Dick as a mammal into a shark. Uh, he, he gets the species confused. Uh, uh, Ishmael is caught by that, but then comes out to see the beauty of the mammal. And I think that this opens up ecological ways of looking at Moby Dick um, uh, in powerful ways that, um, that, uh, that, um, uh, that can teach uh, about present day consciousness of interspecies subjectivity and this uh, appreciation for, uh, for species diversity and a lot of the thinking that this generation is valuing and hopefully can act on. Um, yes, Melville does, uh, this is Thomas, uh, asked about, uh, 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 does Melville recognize the intelligence of this animal? Yeah, Ahab realizes the intelligence, but it's a malignant intelligence that actually isn't there. And Starbuck says, it's just a dumb brute, but Starbuck doesn't recognize that it's more than a dumb brute. And Ishmael comes to realize uh, that it is, uh, that whales have their own cultures. And this next quote, I think, this famous quote, on the next slide from uh, the Grand Armada um, is this, uh, this moment where they're actually killing whales and then there are these nursing mothers with the baby whales that are in this lake amidst the killing. And people like Ishmael go in there and they see, uh, read this, read this uh, for a moment. Uh, at the end, uh, he talks about uh, uh, these nursing whales uh, as human infants while suckling will calmly and fixedly gaze away from the breast as if leading two different lives at the time. And while yet drawing mortal nourishment, still, it's still spiritually feasting upon some earthly reminiscence. So he's looking down at these baby whales, looking up from under the ocean through their own glasses of water and seeing, seeing him. And there's this incredible encounter across species that does recognize uh, a consciousness, uh, Thomas, and I think that that's a good thing and to get students to think about. But this is the later Ishmael that realizes uh, uh, the majesty and bounty of what the whale can teach about life itself. So um, um, let's go on for uh, let's go on for um, a, a, a couple moments, and then um, quickly. Um, um, this is just saying uh, that uh, Melville is aware that whales can be tortured, and they are tortured here, and he has sympathy for them. And that he also says that they're tortured in order to take their body parts. And as he says at the bottom here, illuminate the solemn churches that preach unconditional inoffensiveness by all to all. Uh, the light in the church is taken from this whale oil. That's that perverse sublimation. Uh, 
Melba was aware of that, that civilization is a veneer uh, that's premised upon all this wealth being pulled up from the bottom of the ocean and, and uh, a byproduct of this butchering process. And, uh, and that is a, a symbol of, uh, of the emergent uh, capitalism that's happening at his time. That's the harvesting, um, the harvesting of these resources for, for human benefit. Um, so um, uh, if, uh, if we go on here, there's another way you can get into the Moby Dick. You can get in through these implements of whaling, I said. That each of these is, is a symbolic material artifact. The Melville uses symbolically as something more than that. And uh, I think you can see how he starts with the ballast of the thing and then spins out into his thinking by using the symbolism of that, like he does with fast fish and loose fish, uh, where you put a waif pole in a whale that you've killed so that someone else can't claim it. That makes it a fast fish. And he meditates on whether, uh, uh, on, uh, he said America was a loose fish to, uh, to Columbus. Uh, and, uh, and he says, what are you reader? A fast, uh, a loose fish and a fast fish too, that you're both, that his lines have you, that you're in there and you have freedom, but you're also caught in the mesh of destiny here, this loonings of the text. So implements of whaling is a way to get into it. And the next one, it talks about another avenue into the text. And it's one of the ways that Melville brings the world into this isolated whaler in the middle of the ocean is nine different times they encounter other ships in the ocean. And those social encounters bring other individuals and symbols and uh, experiences into the novel. Uh, and uh, uh, each of them can be looked at by your students as doing different kind of work. Um, uh, the three, uh, three interesting ones are the three in the middle here, the German, the French, and the English ship, in which Melville sort of uh, uses American humor to sort of uh, needle and get at, uh, diddle these, uh, uh, these, these Europeans uh, who the Americans are smart enough to uh, take whales away from them. Uh, so he brings in different nationalities the way he does with the islands and Marty into this text. Some of these other ships are symbolic of different fates. The albatross is white and frozen. Uh, the virgin is empty. The bachelor is full. Okay, uh, um, uh, and the delight is, is, is destroyed at the end. And the delight in the Rachel uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, the same will end to be have all suffered at the hands of Moby Dick, so as the Jerry Bone. And, uh, and yet uh, Ahab does not listen to these, uh, to these uh, outside messages that come by the means of the GAM, a GAM meaning a social meeting of two or more whale ships. Now we'll bring sociality into the text through these nine chapters that break up the philosophy and the action of the text to bring in other, other sensibilities. I think that's a pretty powerful way to teach, um, uh, um, uh, to bring those in. Um, and it opens up the text. Uh, they're not just isolated in the middle of the ocean. Okay, um, I think, uh, I think what, I, what I'd like to do now is to uh, go quickly through a few texts uh, because I didn't say that, um, uh, I didn't start with characters, which is probably the way that people who teach Moby Dick begin with. Call me Ishmael is not the first words. It is in token of my admiration for his genius, the inscription to Hawthorne. Okay, and then there's etymology and extracts which doesn't have Ishmael there at the beginning, these other characters that are gathering these uh, wealth of words about the whale and bringing it in at the outset of the text. So if, if we go on, we can see that Melville's engagement with Hawthorne was a part of this while he was writing Moby Dick. This link in the bottom, this is also there in the resources link. It is there at the materials section at the bottom of the right. I encourage you to open that, download it, and save it because it has these links. I think these letters to Hawthorne and this particular review of Hawthorne's work, while Melville is writing Moby Dick, opens up a different voice that contrasts with Ishmael's. Uh, and, uh, 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 and it says a lot about Melville's own aspirations. It's better to fail in originality than to succeed in imitation. Failure is the true test of greatness. This book failed in Melville's time. 
Um, but it became the trust of, of his greatness because he was doing the great art of telling the truth like Shakespeare, covertly and deceiving, egregiously deceiving the superficial skimmer of pages. The person that reads Moby Dick at one level and doesn't dive with Melville into the text. That's where Moby Dick is just seen as an allegory and Ahab, uh, Ahab's quest is the meaning of this text because readers don't realize that it is Ishmael's book ultimately who survives Ahab's story uh, by telling it again. I think that's a way of looking at it. Uh, and you go on again to the next one and Melville's writing all these letters to Hawthorne. Uh, I think in some ways, uh, he, he wishes that uh, Hawthorne, who was very cerebral, was like Queequeg, uh, and that there, uh, the relationship there is one of the ways that he imagines his connection with, with uh, uh, Hawthorne, because Queequeg eats these rare beef sticks and grapples them with his harpoon across the table and eats them. But uh, his criticism of Hawthorne to Edward Dykink is that he needs roast beef done rare. I think in Quick Quick, uh, Melville creates a, a Hawthorne that has not just the head, but a heart and hands, uh, someone that he hoped Hawthorne might be. And in the next uh, slide, you can see uh, this incredible wisdom um, that's there in the letters, um, in the letters to Hawthorne. Uh, Lord, at the bottom, Lord, when shall we be got done growing? And this idea that he knows he's written a wicked book, but he also knows the one above it. Uh, look at this. Though I wrote the Gospels in this century, I should die in the gutter. I stand for the heart to dogs with the head. I'd rather be a fool with a heart than Jupiter Olympus with his head. What does it mean that Melville's bringing his heart into this text, and how does it flow into this mix of genres and this anatomy of different parts of the whale to try to make meaning and give light to his exploration. I think that's a, that's a, that's a, a key aspect of, uh, of the text. So I encourage you to get into um, the Hawthorne letters um, and the links there will bring you to all of them and to the review because that's another way into it. And I think along with the trip to England and his re-engagement with Shakespeare, uh, his relationship with Hawthorne are three of the things that deepens the wisdom that he brings to this text, Moby Dick. Um, okay, so um, um, we can talk a little bit about the questions that you might have. If we go to the next one, we can say that uh, you can start by looking at characters. We Traditionally, you might talk about Ahab as a character or the other characters like Starbuck or, or Pip or... Um, Fridala or Queequeg, and those are ways of get, getting into it. Uh, but I think it's important to understand that um, these aren't real people. These are Melville's imaginations. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I do with my students whenever I teach this to whoever, is that when Ahab drops his tear into the ocean here um, uh, uh, in the symphony after his engagement with, with uh, Starbuck, Novel says, after this tea, tear goes into the sea, this salty drop into this huge ocean, Novel says, nor did all the Pacific contain such wealth as that one wee drop. What is the meaning of Ahab's tear? And I think if students can answer that, they can try to understand that, uh, that he also is deeper than he's made out to be. And that Melville would not be able to write this text if he did not have an Ahab in him as well, that he was able to survive. Right? Um, and uh, if we go to the next one here, I can answer some questions about characters. I'm saying that these may not be real people and we can confuse Ishmael just might be a narrative presence and obviously he disappears and hears things that he's not privy to in the text. But I make this equation here. Ishmael's relationship to Queequeg is like Ahab's relationship to Fadala, but Queequeg and Fadala are composite characters. They're mixed people. They don't come from real places. They mix ethnicities. Uh, and uh, um, they're really phantasms that in some ways express the interiorities of Ishmael and Ahab, especially Fidel's crew, which doesn't, don't even have substance. They're like uh, phantoms. Uh, so I think, um, I think asking about these characters is the traditional way into it. And I'm wondering if you have any questions 
about Melvin's characters that we could respond to for a moment before, uh, at the end, looking at uh, how Moby Dick itself swims in the ocean of popular culture. What, um, what questions might you have about, uh, about some of the characters? Because you could take 75 minutes to look at Ahab and Starbuck and their relationship, or to the presence of Pip in this text. Uh, and uh, each of them is well worth meditating on because they represent parts of Ishmael's consciousness about the different facets of human human nature that are brought together into this symposium of this text. Go ahead, Andy. Well, I was just going to invite our audience to type into the chat box, uh, share with us any questions you might have about these characters, either the relationship between each other, perhaps the uh, the individual ways that, that Tim uh, can help you understand how to introduce those to your students. Um, what questions do you have about the, the characters themselves? And I think it was an important note that you made uh, that you actually didn't introduce characters until well into this webinar, uh, which implies uh, both that it's um, that it's a an entry point that that might sort of come later on, but also maybe that it's the the, the final big point to make. So, what kind of questions do you have about the characters? We'll give people a chance to flex their fingers and get to their keyboards. Oh. Yeah, I think I think characters are where people normally go to to begin with in teaching yeah, sure. But I think one needs to be suspicious that Melville is creating these characters, which are literally characters on the page, for effects that they aren't real people. And I think that's uh, that it is fiction. That's part of his deviousness and part yeah. of his playlarking. Doing yeah. this well as a standpoint for uh, Melville himself. Um, or as a broader sense of humanity. I think um, both of those are really powerfully true. I mean, there is that moment in the fountain, right? When uh, when Melville and Ishmael come together, where he talks about the, him riding up in his garret on the 16th of December. And uh, in the American uh, edition, it was 1850, and he changed it a year later to show the work he did on it. That's when they both come together. And he talks about his thoughts being like the spout hole of the whale, and is it vapor? Or is it water? And he's meditating on drinking all this tea and thinking up his novel. They come together there. But I think it's also important that Ishmael's the younger novel, and Ishmael's also the sub-sub and the uh, Hale Usher and other characters in this text. And Melville is using other sensibilities like the blacksmith and the carpenter to reflect on his own literary art. Uh, Ishmael is, a, uh, is the way that Melville tells his story. He isn't necessarily a person uh, that we think he is, and certainly becomes more of a broader sense of humanity as he moves beyond the greenhorn who actually goes through the story that Melville writes about later through Ishmael in the text. Yeah. Excellent. Great question, Ryan. Any other questions about characters? We're, we've got about 10 minutes, Tim, so I do want to keep an eye on the clock. But I'll tell you what, for the audience, if, if there are questions that reveal, uh, please feel free to Drop those into the chat box, and I'll be sure they come up before we're done tonight. Yeah, so let's, go, yeah, go please, ask, please ask any questions that you might have. I'm going to turn to the just the last portion here, which goes beyond the text, because I think it's a very powerful way to get your students engaged. And, and that is, we can go to the next one here. That is how Melville's text has influence in popular culture, because this is a way of hooking them. Uh, uh, so if we can go to the next uh, next slide, we can see that Melville said that Leviathan, the Moby Dick, is not the biggest fish I have heard of Krakens. And of course, that might be Pierre, the novel he writes about this. But it also is the way that Moby Dick, as a book, survives, just like Moby Dick the whale is also a survivor of the text with Ishmael. And this book survives its it, uh, it, not having readers in his time to breach again in the 20s and to be uh, the kind of rumored icon of ubiquity uh, uh, in today's consciousness. Uh, Braille Marcus says that Moby Dick remains the sea we swim in, an amazing notion. He's a, uh, Richard Hardock says that Melville is our best known and most obscure author. Moby Dick can be played on many keys and arranged, and there's many musical arrangements of Moby Dick. I just want to take you through some of the ways that artists have looked at Moby Dick, because one of the things you can do with your students, and I, I use this, and I think it really works well, is to send them out there to find a way that Moby Dick is referenced in popular culture and to bring that back 
and it makes for a great class because they see the influence of the text. It's there in um, Audi commercials. It's all over the place. And I just want to show you a couple of these. Um, this is not the terrible Moby Dick of, uh, of, of Ahab, is it? This is a bathtub. He's terrific. It's a different kind of, uh, of terror. And if we go to the next one, uh, this shows how in high art, uh, Jackson Pollock drew upon uh, this in Moby Dick in the 1940s. And uh, uh, in his uh, painting, Blue, uh, uh, if we go to the next one, we see another artist, famous artist named Frank Stella, who made a piece of art or a piece of sculpture every chapter in Moby Dick uh, for years and became one of those artists who became obsessed by Moby Dick and told it through different means. And then that's Frank Stella. And you can look up, there's a whole book of his Moby Dick art, it's abstract. The next one is very, uh, the next artist is uh, Matt Kish, who's very relatable to your students because he writes in a, in a popular cultural style. This man who's a librarian took the Signet edition of Moby Dick and for 350 days did one illustration per day. And that's what this Moby Dick in pictures is. And, uh, uh, and the next, uh, next slide shows a couple of his images, and you can see how it might be attractive to students because it, it, uh, it, speaks, uh, it speaks their verbal genre because uh, uh, Matt Kish was raised with uh, comic books, and Moby Dick itself had an incredible life in a variety of comics that students can draw upon. And this is showing how, uh, uh, look at these artists and how they become Ishmael, just like Ishmael is going around the world finding all these um, and now we're finding all these references to Moby Dick, uh, find, seeing uh, outlines of the whale in, in uh, cliffs, uh, wherever he's looking. And uh, my, uh, my students send these images of whales that they find in nature, and you can create a whole pastiche of whales that just appear in people's consciousness. Uh, students get obsessed with seeing whales and buy into the Ishmaelian way of seeing. Um, there's a couple other artists I'll just show you to end here before we go back to some questions. Um, the, next, uh, the next one, this is Tristan Lowe, and this is a felt Moby Dick made out of felt. Um, it's, it's pretty powerful. Uh, and um, the last image I'll show you. Uh, 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 well, let me, uh, let me say here that uh, you can use art in your teaching of Moby Dick. I mean, have them try to draw the painting and the spouter in. Have them try to illustrate Creek using Melville's clear language. He's much more ludicrous in, if you spell it out than just reading it. Have them uh, draw the Pequot and realize what a cannibal or craft it really is. It helps them to uh, get into the text by following Neville's language and visualizing it itself. And I may not encourage you to take this step with your students, but it happens sometimes. The next slide is, uh, is one of the ways that students have dealt with Moby Dick. If we go on one more, Andy, we can see uh, 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 well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not talking about heavy metal, but uh, uh, heavy metal is a way of getting, and this is, uh, there's been a series of doom metal bands. Ahab, Ahab is a German band, and uh, um, uh, this is Mastodon. Uh, there's a whole musical way of getting into Moby Dick, but it's the next slide that I want that I want to conclude with, which is this idea of tattooing your own body with Moby Dick, and there's a whole you can go on the web and look at all these tattoos and there's something about following Ishmael's path and tattooing uh, your skin with this text. Uh, and just like uh, tattooing the text with your own reading and marking it up, but the problem is that these texts have to be reused in a lot of ways. But uh, a lot of people have put whales, uh, whales on, their, um, uh, uh, on their bodies as a way of, uh, uh, launching with Ishmael into, into the meaning of this. Um, I'm seeing that one of these questions that uh, Jennifer's asking is uh, um, which interpretation is being referenced. Uh, um, uh, and you can see also how a lot of these images of Moby Dick are drawn from other popular cultural images like the, like the uh, uh, movies that give us an image of Moby Dick that may not be the one that Melville himself uh, 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 Maria, I'm not sure what you mean by women were uh, not allowed many things. I think that there's a whole uh, book called Novel and Women in which he looks at women's consciousness here. The lack of female characters, yes, this is a man's world out on the sea, but I think that 
I think that quotation we looked at about the nursing mothers and the whales shows that Ishmael opens to a, a consciousness that is beyond the, tax, the toxic masculinity of Ahab and opens up to as many different sensibilities as he can. Um, it doesn't explain from a modern perspective. It really doesn't. But it. Uh, uh, but I think that one can read Melville as a feminist if one reads, allows Melville to teach us the way that he sees through Ishmael. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's great. There was a, a pretty long thread about that, um, and it started. Uh, yeah. It started early on with um, with uh, a question about the the lack of female characters, and then uh, wondering if if the text itself appeals more to a masculine or feminine audience. But it sounds like you're you're suggesting it really does kind of weave between the two. And I think you can look at Laurie Anderson's uh, reading of Moby Dick, and there's a number of female artists that have their own obsessive ways of looking at Moby Dick um, um, uh, and many, many, many scholars. Um, they may not be female characters in there, but I'm pointing out that characters aren't characters, they're sensibilities, and that there is a, uh, uh, there is an appreciation of, uh, of women's sensibility or even, even uh, Starbucks sensibility uh, brings in a kind of landedness. And Melville talks about having to adapt back uh, um, to uh, uh, our conceits of happiness to the home uh, and, and what is lost when you're cut off at sea from, from these, uh, uh, these connections with others, these relations that are deeply feminist. I, I think what uh, Ishmael does is reconnect to those relations and that's how he's able to survive. He relates everything and by building that web somehow is able to uh, pull up this text, this Moby Dick, the text, uh, and at least let us read it. That's fantastic, Tim. Um, it's unfortunately time for us to wrap tonight's session up. But Tim, I'd like to ask just one final question uh, of you, and then um, and then we're going to thank our audience, and and we'll all uh, we'll all have our nights tour uh, nights free. But Tim, uh, my question for you is, you know, again, Moby Dick is a is a iconic, overwhelming text. You've shared a variety of entry points, layers that teachers could unpack. I think that the conversation and the questions start to get to that real sophistication. But if you could, if you could impart just that one big takeaway, the, the reason why this is worth it, because it, it can be a slog, right? It's a, it's a real commitment to engage students in Moby Dick. T tell us why it's, it's worthwhile. Tell us why in 2019, this text still uh, serves as an important uh, function of our citizenry and, and the way that we understand uh, uh, this kind of work. I, I think a, a, a quick response to that is that America declared independence from the world and has been trying to join the world since, and it creates problems. I think Melville was an American who declared interdependence early and, uh, and realized that to be American, one needed to be global and not turn the world into America. And um, that this book teaches that open, open-handed inclusion of the world that we need, uh, especially young people need to bring about in, in this in this world today. Um, I think that's one way of answering that. I'd love to talk more about that. And I hope to meet you guys again. Uh, please look out for the NEH seminar in 2020 if it comes about. Uh, come spend two weeks exploring this text. Uh, I think Moby Dick is a text that you can begin reading in simple form to children, read in high school, come back in college, I didn't get it until I became a high school teacher. And I think you can also uh, keep reading it all your life and get different things out of it. Draw different fruits and wisdom and ambergris from different readings of the text. It grows with you and become can become a teacher of you for life. That's another reason. That's a, it's a wonderful way to conclude. Tim, I want to thank you for joining us in leading tonight's session on Moby Dick. And again, I want to reiterate, uh, as you've shared uh, a couple of times, that there are lots of opportunities for interested teachers to spend more time with you and, and other experts in the field to really better understand this, uh, this iconic work. Tim, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Take care. And thank you to all of our participants tonight. I really do appreciate you spending time with us this evening. Uh, please keep an eye on the National Humanities Center social media for updates and uh, notices of new events. Uh, our Facebook page, our Twitter feed, and our YouTube channel all um, are great ways to, uh, to see what's happening, both in terms of 
uh, on-site and face-to-face -face activities as well as virtual activities like tonight's webinar. When I close the room, uh, you will be prompted to complete a survey and once you've done so, you can download a certificate with your name on it that certifies the time that you've spent with us. Um, please join us for uh, more webinars this spring. Um, our next webinar is scheduled for uh, next Thursday, February the 28th. We'll be working with Claire Clark, who's an assistant professor of behavioral science and history at the University of Kentucky. And the topic for that session will be addiction in American history. Uh, so I invite you to join us. If you haven't signed up and this sounds very, very appealing to you, uh, you can email Libby or myself and we'll get you in, um, hopefully get you in at least on a waiting list um, and uh, and hopefully we'll see you then. So thanks for everything. Have a great day at school tomorrow. Uh, we'll see you again uh, at the National Humanities Center webinar, um, Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night.